good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. I'm just going to go ahead and bring Pastor Dave up here to bring the word of God. He is uh, actually family. He and I look a lot alike. And uh, <laughs> actually, Pastor, uh, I know Joanne's not here, but she's watching tonight over the, the internet. And she says hello. And uh, she's, uh, Pastor Dave is related to uh, father and mother in law. He pastors Word of Hope uh, Christian Church. Is that, is, did I get it right? Christian Church in uh, Quezon City, Philippines. One of the fastest growing, largest churches in the Philippines. Doing a great work. That's where my wife and I were married inside their, their church building 19 years ago. <laughs> a long time ago. But we're just so honored and thankful that a man that God uses around the world would come here to our little church to bring us the word of the Lord. I believe God's going to give us a word tonight. Amen. Amen. I want to say this before he comes. His father, uh, uh, Pastor Victor, has had more impact on my life than any other man in the gospel. Uh, when I go to his place, we just sit and I just listen to him talk and he'll pray for me. And I'm just so thankful for the passion that his dad helped birth in my life for miracles. And uh, he sees a lot of them. So I'm just so thankful, Pastor, for you being here tonight. Just come and share the word of the Lord and take your time, whatever you feel like doing. Let God use you in Jesus' name. Come on, my brother. Amen. I didn't know that they are in Hawaii until, uh, until uh, a few days ago when I was told that uh, I was scheduled to uh, speak here tonight in your church. And it's a wonderful surprise. And uh, praise God. I know uh, I've known Joanne for many, many years. Of course, I've known uh, her dad. It's my first cousin <laughs> from the Philippines. And uh, we praise the Lord that they are here also. Glory to God. How many of you are excited in the yes. Lord tonight? Yes. Amen. And uh, I trust that... Uh, what I'm going to share with you tonight will be an encouragement to your faith and in your service to the Lord. Let's all stand together reading God's Word, uh, found in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13 to 18. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 to 18. It says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater an, an oath, for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirm it by an oath, that by Two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Amen. Our Father God, we thank you for your goodness to us. I pray, Lord, that you're going to speak to us in a very powerful way from your word. We pray, God, that... You're going to inspire the faith of each one of us here so that we will serve you in a greater way. And this church, oh God, hallelujah, where we're at tonight, will do greater things for you in the coming days. Yes, Lord. We pray that you will meet every need represented tonight. Yes, Lord. May you anoint the lips of your servant as well as the ears of your people. Yes. And we shall be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' yes, name, we ask these things. Everybody said a big amen. Amen. Please be seated. Now tonight, I would like to share with you a message entitled, The Big Three Promises of God. The Big Three Promises of God. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. Aren't there thousands of God's promises in the Bible? Yes. You know, there are thousands of God's promises 
In fact, there is a song that says, every promise in the book is mine, every chapter, every verse, every line. <laughs> and uh, if you've been in Pentecostal circles, you have heard that song. But you can uh, take all the promises of God from Genesis to Revelation. You can put them in three main categories. In three main categories. And tonight, I'm going to speak to you on those three major or three big promises of God. Now, there are two things I want to do all over the promises of God. Number one, that God never lies. Okay? God never lies. He is incapable of lying. There are a lot of people who lie, you know, and, and uh, especially in the Philippines and also here in America, politicians make a lot of promises. They promise a lot, but they deliver little. But there are those, you know, who uh, actually lie through their teeth just to get elected. You know, I'm talking about the Philippines. But there are those that are good politicians. They really meant well. And they want to do good for their country. They want to do good for the people that they serve. But, you know what? They do not, they could not deliver on what they promise. Because they lack the power and they lack the resources to deliver on their promises. But God is not like that. The second thing about that, that you need to remember about the promises of God is that God always fulfill His promises. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? He will always fulfill His promises. In Matthew chapter 24 verse 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Praise the Lord. And uh, so those are the two major things that you need to remember before we get into the message tonight about God's promises. God never lies. He will not lie. He cannot lie. Right. Hallelujah. That's what the Bible says. Amen. He, he cannot lie. It says in Numbers chapter 23 verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie nor a son of man that he should repent as he has has he said, and he will not, and he will not do, or has he spoken, will he not make it good? In yeah. Titus chapter 1 verse 2 it says, in hope of eternal life, in which God, who cannot lie, Amen. promised before time began. That's awesome, That's awesome right? Yeah. Praise God. So, first of all, God made a promise to Abraham. God made a promise to Abraham. We find that promise in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 to 3. God said to Abraham, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, as a result of God's promise to Abraham, God gave Abraham a land. He gave him a land, right? And God gave Abraham a son and many, many children. Although it was humanly impossible for Abraham and Sarai to have a son, you know, they, God gave Isaac to Abraham in his old days. You know, uh, Sarai was 95 years old when she gave birth to Isaac. Now, have you ever heard of a grandmother <laughs> getting pregnant? <laughs> you know, no medical remedy can, you know, can do that. But God fulfilled his promise to Abraham. And because of the promises of God to Abraham, God made a commitment to Israel. God made a commitment to Israel. 
You know, Israel is, <laughs> is a nation that's hated by many, many people. You know, Haman, Haman tried to annihilate them. But because of God's promise. The guy who prepared a gallows for Mordecai, he hanged with his own gallows. <laughs> Hitler tried to annihilate the Jews. He incinerated six million Jews in those gas chambers during World War II. But he was not able to annihilate them all. Why? Because of God's promise and covenant to Abraham and to uh, Jacob and to David. And if you look at the map of Israel today, you know, Israel is the only nation that after 1,500 years, it, exists, it ceased to exist as a nation. Now, according to historians, um, they say that once a nation ceased to exist for about 100 years, that, that nation is dead. But after being out of the map, <laughs> no nation of Israel for 1,500 years, in 1948, it became a nation again. Why? Because of the promise of God. Right? If you look at the map today of Israel, I've been there four times. You look at the map of Israel compared to the Arab neighbors. If you look at the world map, you know that the size of the nation of Israel in the map is about the size of Four dots of my, my profile. Compared to the Arab land, it occupies about 1% of land compared to occupied by the Arabs. But yet, Israel today, though very small, is a very powerful nation. a promise. God made a promise. They will never be annihilated again. The only one who will try to destroy them will be the Antichrist. But before he could destroy Israel, Jesus, the Messiah, will come back and the Jews, hallelujah, and the remnants will recognize him. They will look on him, the Bible says, whom they have pierced. And they will be saved as a nation Amen. Amen. when the Messiah comes, which is, of course, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is not through with Israel yet. He will fulfill his promise to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Israel, and to Jacob. Amen. That is the promise that God made. That's why there is a special kind of blessing to people who will bless Israel, who will pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And I encourage you, brothers and sisters, that from time to time, you pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You need to pray for Israel, amen, and for the people of God so that they will recognize Jesus as their Messiah. Do you know that today there are tens of thousands of missionaries Jews. They believe in Jesus Christ. I preach in one in the largest messianic church in the world, in Kiev. A few years ago in Kiev, by the thousands. And and, and you know, it was my privilege to preach in a large auditorium. They packed and and they invited me to preach there. And the service at 4 30. And I thought, well, maybe because that Saturday. I would be done by around 7.30. I was mistaken. <laughs> by 7.30, they're still singing and dancing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And worshiping God. 
and and uh, they sang, you know, in the Hebrews and in in Russian, and they pray. Man, I've I've never seen a worship like that. Wow. Praise and worship for four hours, and then the lame begin to walk. You'll see healing instantly being made, the power of God being manifested while they are singing. And like some churches, they just sing and sing and sing, and you're sleepy, you know. When will it end, you know? But, but not there. When I was there, I, I was so amazed. They gave me the platform to preach at 8.30 at night. Wow. Wow. By this time, you know, I was jet lagging, right? <laughs> Lord, anoint me. You know? So I thought the people are already tired, so I preached for 45 minutes, wow. including interpretation. And when I was done, they said, is that all you got? <laughs> So they brought me back again to preach. <laughs> and after I preach, they begin to sing and they begin to dance. Oh, wow. Finally, at 11 o'clock, I told my interpreter, will you please tell the pastor, I still have to preach tomorrow, three times this Sunday. Can, I, can you bring me back to my hotel? God is moving in the hearts of of the Jews today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and you know what? I was in France just a year ago. You know, there was this lady who came from Israel who got saved. You know what her job was? To recruit Jews, no matter what they are, no matter whether they believe, they are religious. They are recruiting Jews. She was recruiting Jews to go back to Israel because she said many of them they, they could not understand, but in their hearts, they want to go back to their own land. Amen. Wow. Amen. And the government promised them a place to stay wow. if you want to go back. Wow. Amen. Many are going back. They could, not, they could not, you know, understand why there is a the homing desire yeah. in their hearts. Right. God put it there. Because of his promise to Abraham. So that's big promise number one. Big promise number two. God made a promise to his church. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 verse 18. Upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades or hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. I want you to look at that verse. Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know, when I was a younger minister, I thought because of the song that we sing, you hold the fort for I am coming, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, I felt at the time, I believe at that time, that the church is on the defensive. That the church is being attacked by Satan. Of course, the enemy attacks us. And that, you know, the church, you know, is, is trying to hold the horn. It's trying to, to prevent the enemy from destroying the church. Until, you know, a professor of mine began to... Do an exegesis. Do an yes. exegesis. My eyes became wide open. Because wow. it says, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And by the way, uh, Peter is not the foundation of the church. Right, 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 right. Peter, you know, in, in, in uh, Greek is Petros. You know, it's small pebble, small rock. He is not the founder of the church. He is not the rock. The rock is Jesus Christ. The word rock is Petra, a mountain rock. Hallelujah. So Jesus is the foundation of the church. Hallelujah. And when he said the gates of hell cannot prevail against us. Have you ever seen a gate? 
that it moves? No. But you know, it's the church that is on the offensive side. We are in the offense. We are attacking the gates of hell. It will not prevail. It will not stop the church. We will be conquering territories and territories for God. God's army, the church, is greater in number than the combined armed forces of America, of Russia, of China, hallelujah, and all other countries of the world. There are more born-again Christians today that are alive than all the combined armed forces of the world. Hallelujah. The armies of this world is no match to the power of Satan. But Satan trembles at the size and at the power of God's army, the church. 1.3 billion born-again Christians in the world today. And you say amen. amen. And you say amen. amen. Because sometimes, you know, those of us who come to church on Sunday night, we felt like we are the minority, you know. There are only few of us here. Oh, poor me. No. Every local church is powerful. Every local church. God promised power to the church. Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Okay, on the one hand he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And then he said, in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost is come upon you. So the question is, where is the power today? There is a transparency of power from Jesus Christ to the church. Hallelujah. Don't look at me like you're surprised. <laughs> You know, right. it's local church Amen. is a power station. Amen. I want you to think about this. I don't know where the main power source of Oahu is. You know, there's the main plant, yeah. electrical power. Yeah. And, uh, every part of Honolulu or Oahu, they have power stations. That's right. Power station of Kailua. Power station for Waipaho and uh, all the other places, they have local power station. Every local church is a power station of the Holy Spirit. So that this place, when you gather together, you have the power of the greatest power of the universe. The Holy Spirit, hallelujah. The Holy Spirit is the greatest power in the world today, hallelujah. So that God wants His church to be strong. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. You know, I used to pastor in Seattle, Washington, a long time ago. And uh, every after every service, there is this sister. Ella Brown. She's a wonderful, loving lady. But every service on Sunday, she would come to me after I prayed for everybody. Oh, Pastor, I almost didn't make it this Sunday. She's about 65 years old. And because the devil is after me, giving me a bad time, I almost didn't wake up this morning to come to church. I barely made it. Please pray for me. So I would pray for her. <laughs> After I pray for her, she gives me an apple pie. And she bakes the best pie. <laughs> then on Sunday night again, she will be coming to church. Oh, Pastor, the devil is really bad, you know. He's attacking me again. I barely made it. Will you please pray for me? I would pray for her. And she will feel good. And I got a coconut cream pie. Wow. <laughs> then on Wednesday night, this goes on for weeks. And I love the pie. It's, I mean, it's better than what you can buy from Applebee's or whatever. 
says, good cook. But after a few weeks of that, I said, Sister Ella, I tell you what, I'm not going to pray for you this time, but I want to let you know this. The Bible says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And the Bible says that you have the Holy Spirit in you. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And then I begin to just inspire her by the words of God. And she left. But since that time, no more pie. And let me tell you, I was sorry. No more pie. And one day I said, how are you, Sister Ella? Well, praise God, Pastor, I had the victory. I should have gotten the biggest pie. But just to let you know, brothers and sisters, we got the power in the name of Jesus. Because Jesus is coming for a glorious church. He's not going to come back for an anemic church. He's not going to come back for a weakling church. Hallelujah. I believe that the greatest revival for the church is still in the future. It's coming before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We're going to, we're going to experience the greatest spiritual awakening this world has ever seen. Before the rapture. Hallelujah. Don't be pessimistic. There are guys right now that are pessimistic, you know, about...